Stealth games have come a long way from being a relatively niche genre to gaining immense popularity in the last decade, decade and a half. To the point almost all action adventure games have stealth elements thrown in, be it GTA, Red Dead Redemption, Far Cry or even first person shooters. These three franchises are responsible for that kind of growth. Hitman, Metal Gear Solid and Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell. Let's compare the newest installment of these three series and find out once and for all who truly is the king of the shadows. Stealth Mechanics These games have introduced various innovative and creative stealth elements over the years. Like the disguise system in Hitman or Metal Gear Solid where you had to actually change your controller's port to beat Mantis or Splinter Cell with night vision goggles using light and darkness in a way no one has ever done before. Now let's take a look at these stealth mechanics in each game individually. Phantom Pain was the first Metal Gear Solid to have an open world and even though the map was predominantly empty, when it comes to approaching missions, the freedom to take any path was always nice. You could snipe out targets from a vantage point without alerting enemies or you could take the traditional approach of sneaking in with the help of amazing tools and gadgets and decoys and wolf dogs and cardboard boxes and much more. There are different approaches, different paths, but also different times of day that affect your mission. Sneaking in during the night is easier as some guards are sleeping and those who are awake have a harder time spotting you. Additionally, there are environmental factors such as rain and sandstorms you can run around in a sandstorm and not get detected or run faster when it's raining as it'll mask your footsteps. You can interrogate enemies to know the layout or just ship them back to your base with a futon and recruit them to your own organization. The game has so many creative gameplay elements that developers have not only thought of but also executed really well. There's almost an endless supply of weapons and devices to experiment with. Within the main objective, there are self-imposed objectives like you want to recruit a skilled soldier instead of taking them out on the battlefield. In situations like these, those unique weapons and gadgets come in handy. All these things add new dynamics to gameplay, keeping it interesting. To subdue soldiers, you need to invest in non-lethal weapons and for that you need to secure resources on the battlefield. Almost everything you do in the game goes hand in hand. If you want to remain undetected, you could invest in stealth suits or simply shoot out lights in the area, which is a much cheaper solution. Gameplay can vary even more depending on who you decide to bring with you as your companion. Bring D-Dog to the field and he'll tag enemies or Quiet who'll snipe enemies from afar as well as tag them. You can command her to do either or both. If I start listing out every small detail in the game, it will literally take hours, so we can only imagine how much depth and detail the game has. Hitman is a very different stealth game when compared to Metal Gear. Hitman is about blending in, while MGS is more about sneaking in. Hitman 3 shines when it's being played by a creative player. If you play the game like any other stealth game, sure you'll have a good time, but in order to get the most out of it, you need to play it like it was made to be played. That means disguises, silly traps, scouting maps for hours on end until you find that one brilliant way to complete your mission. Phantom Pain is about you and your weapons, while Hitman is centered around the environment. Assassinations performed by Agent 47 aren't typical. They are meant to be done leaving absolutely no trace of our favorite bald assassin. While the game has a fair share of weapons, it doesn't necessarily want you to use them and it kind of even punishes you for not playing as a silent assassin. Mission stories are excellent examples of this. They are a certain set of events that will lead you to a unique assassination. These are really well done, almost every assassination is satisfying. If you're a more hands-on player and want to finish the objective with your own hands, you can do that too. But again, developers want you to play in a certain way. The majority of Hitman 3 is a slow burn. Every action leads up to that one amazing moment that is worth the patience you show throughout. MGS and Splinter Cell have stealth mechanics that give you a kind of instant gratification. But Hitman, as I said, is a slow burn. But make no mistake, it does give you an absolutely satisfying moment in the end. Carl Ingram finally gets what he deserves.
Splinter Cell Backlist feels like a mix between Hitman and Metal Gear. Gameplay feels like MGS, while the environments are Hitman-esque. Blacklist offers a good amount of weapons and gadgets to craft your own style of gameplay. Sure, the game does want you to play it like a stealth game, but it doesn't punish you if you decide to go some other way. It offers a certain verticality that others don't have. You can scale mountains, buildings, or climb a pipe and make your way across a room, or use zip lines to move across streets. This literally adds a new dimension, which in turn makes the stealth here unique. Sam feels like a ninja or a jungle cat, capable of moving in every plane. He's fast, strong, agile. The cover system is great too, so just moving is a joy here. Couple that with a solid melee system and you're bound to have fun. For a 10-year-old game, this is remarkable. The fluidity and how smooth everything feels. Blacklist uses light and shadows better than any stealth game. Taking the time to take out lights and using your night vision goggles is an important gameplay element. Moving from shadow to shadow and finishing the objective without anyone knowing you were there is challenging. If you do pull it off, the game rates you as a ghost and for me, it was by far the most enjoyable playstyle of the three. Ghost, Panther and Assault Every stealth game needs an environment that acts as a foil for all the chaos you cause. Let's take a closer look at the environments these games offer. Phantom Pain experimented with going open world and it's a hit and miss. It gave a lot of freedom when it comes down to approaching missions, but in between mission areas, there was nothing to do or see. Yeah, you could take out some guards at a checkpoint or bring some animals back to base, but nothing worth exploring. Sometimes the landscape just added to the frustration. If an enemy camp was on the other side of a mountain, you have to go through 10 minutes of nothingness just to get there. When you do eventually get to the mission area, everything from that point on is just perfection. The way most enemy camps are built is brilliant. You have to evade snipers, crawl through foliage, and then climb up a vantage point and scout the entire area. Of course, after you've taken out whoever's there, then find a plan and a path to where you're supposed to go. The game has two distinct maps, an Afghani desert and an African grassland. On first glance, you might think, if there are only two maps and they are mostly empty, it should get repetitive real quick, right? Wrong. Gameplay is so good, couple that with mission design and you'll be engaged for a good amount of time. The first mission in Afghanistan shows off almost everything the game has to offer. You are required to sneak through a village that has almost every kind of plane and environment and this is the first time you are let into the open world, so you get to experience the freedom the game offers. Hitman 3 has Agent 47 and the environment as its two leads. The map and the level design are what Hitman games are built on. Every Hitman, even Absolution, relies on the environment to play a major role. Think of Blood Money and Silent Assassin. I could probably list out all the maps in those two games and that's because of how iconic and memorable they were. Hitman 3 does that and sometimes does it even better. Every map feels like a different game altogether. Take a look at the Knives Out inspired mission and the Berlin mission. They feel completely different from each other. The maps aren't all style and no substance either. Most things in the environment are possible weapons. This brings a level of importance to the environment that very few other games have. Environments are filled with things to rig, drinks to poison, and people to take disguises from. It could be argued that the environment is the most important thing to make this game great. Square Enix tried to limit players' freedom and make maps linear in Hitman Absolution, and we all know how that turned out. Here, you have maps in six countries in three continents, that feel completely unique from one another. Maps have so much going on in them that even if you replay missions two or three times, you still won't see everything the game has to offer. The game is just designed to be replayed multiple times and I think the environments add a lot in terms of replayability. Maps are creative with different entries and different paths that bring their own challenges and opportunities for assassinations. Why 
Splinter Cell Blacklist has a more linear map than the other two and it's very similar to Absolution in terms of going in one certain direction. The verticality that I mentioned earlier does make the maps more fun. The game offers free running or parkour to a certain degree. There are obstacle courses like sections in the environment allowing for parkour. Parkour is combined with combat in a neat way as well. Pulling enemies off a cliff or jumping on someone from a pipe are all fun as you'd expect. But when you get past these first few missions and kind of get used to these things, maps can start feeling the same. You're mostly sneaking around in buildings except for a few sections. But I must say, level design is well done. There are very few dull moments. Even though maps are pretty small, there's something always going on. These three games in particular have very average narratives. They are entertaining at times, but mostly it's something we have already seen. Previous Metal Gear games were filled with cutscenes. Metal Gear 4 felt like a movie with playable sections in between. Phantom Pain on the other hand has very few cutscenes. You could play up to 6 hours and not encounter a single cutscene. To say that the story was underwhelming would be a huge understatement. We play as Venom Snake, or at least we think we do. He rarely talks or shows emotions for that matter. And then there's the controversy that the game cut out almost 50% of its cutscenes and the original ending was scrapped altogether. When I finished the game, I couldn't believe that was the end. Replaying this game is near impossible because we know everything we do in the game ends up with a lackluster ending. That's not to say all the characters in the game are boring. Even though Snake didn't talk all that much, he had an aura about him. Supporting characters range from Quiet to Ocelot are a hit and miss. Quiet doesn't speak, so the only character that kept me engaged was Ocelot. The way he talks with Big Boss and their dynamic was always interesting. The villain Skullface had mystique and was intriguing in Ground Zero, but in Phantom Pain, he fizzles out with no real personality. D-Dog was more interesting than some of the characters in the game. Miller was also great, Huey was good, but Hideo Kojima is known for creating legendary, convoluted stories, so this was a letdown. Original Hitman games had an above average plot, nothing extraordinary, the game's focus was gameplay. The rebooted series takes this formula and goes even further. That's kinda why gameplay is so good, but it also means that the plot won't get as much attention. I don't want to spoil the plot here. But Hitman 3 is a continuation of the first two games. It does have a more personal story with focus on friendships, betrayals and more. The game does have a memorable ending, but from the beginning to the middle of the game, the story is weak, but during certain parts, you will be intrigued by the narrative. Unlike previous Hitmans, side characters are actually interesting here. Agent 47 himself shows more emotions as well. Blacklist made me lose interest in its plot very early on. A new group are threatening the fate of America, so the fourth echelon is formed with Sam as its leader to stop threats. I really can't recall any more of the story. Everyone except Sam is forgettable, some conversations were engaging, but the overarching plot was a snooze fest at best. It felt like a distraction from the awesome gameplay most of the time. Metal Gear Solid 5 is a very well made game with amazing gameplay mechanics and a game world that can feel barren at times but still has a lot of high points. The plot is average with a few highlights here and there. For gameplay, I give it a 9, the game world gets a 7 and the plot gets a 5, so a total of 21 out of 30. Hitman 3 is one of the most polished stealth games out there with incredibly fluid gameplay that gives the player so many options. The world is diverse with wonderful maps, the plot is slightly better than the first two games in the trilogy, so gameplay gets an 8, the world earns a 9 and the plot gets a 5, earning a total of 22 out of 30. Splinter Cell Blacklist is a compact game that delivers some of the coolest stealth action out there, with a world that explores verticality successfully. The plot leaves a lot to be desired, 
So gameplay gets an 8, the game world gets a 6 and the plot gets a 4. Blacklist earns a total of 17 out of 30. Well, that's all we have for today. Make sure to subscribe if you like this video. A lot of similar stuff will be up on this channel. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and see you next time.